fishing from a charter boat, whether it's as an individual or as part of an organised group, to some extent puts your potential for success in the hands of other people. The most important amongst these has to be the skipper of the boat. If he can't find fish, then what chance have you got of catching them? OK lads, when you're ready you can start. In my experience, most charter skippers are extremely professional and will do anything within their power to make the trip a success. Unfortunately, however, it isn't always down to them. Location, seasonality, tide size and weather also have a part to play. And what might not suit one venue could be ideal for somewhere else. In a nutshell, it all boils down to local knowledge. This is one of the main things you buy in when you book a spot on a charter trip. Who is better placed to say what the situation is likely to be than the person fishing it day in and day out? So be prepared to listen and take any advice that may be offered. But more importantly, at the time of booking, ask questions to be sure that what you think you are getting is going to be the right package for you. Uh, to anybody new to boat fishing, thinking of booking a, a charter trip, you should always phone the skipper up and ask various questions to do the trip, i.e. size of the tide they're fishing, what type of fishing they can expect, what bait they need to use, any, any sort of information to do with that, like should they phone you the night before to check the weather, um, what the sailing time is, that's it, yeah. Uh, the best sort of bait to use on the day, what species of fish they'd be fishing for, uh, does the skipper do rod hire, how much does it cost, also ask if the boat has a self-draining deck with open scuppers. If it has, water can also get in as well as out, so expect to have some washing over your feet, particularly towards the stern, and wear a pair of waterproof boots. How the trip is to be fished will often determine the best place to be on the boat, and the best tactical approach to adopt. Essentially, there are two options. The trip will either be fished on the drift, as is being done here, or the boat will be brought to anchor. If the boat is big enough, or if the party is small enough, try to line up and fish along the same side, with all the lines being taken away from the boat by the tide. If this isn't possible, those who are disadvantaged by having the lines going under the boat should be given the favourable side on the next drift, with the procedure alternated by turning the boat around after every move. Fishing on the drift is a very different proposition to fishing at anchor. At anchor, providing you use sufficient lead to beat the tide and keep the baits in the feeding zone, it's a case then of waiting for a fish to come along and bite. On the drift, keeping the baits on the bottom can be a constant battle, and often you need to work harder to catch some fish. So having the right amount of lead on the end of your line is crucial. You'll also need to keep checking that the lead is touching bottom, and if it isn't, let out more line until it touches again. Doing this repeatedly means that eventually you'll have so much line out that the angle it forms will be too great, at which point it pays to wind in, redrop and start all over again. Choice of terminal rigs also needs to be carefully considered. Drifting over rough ground, droppers positioned above the lead work best. Hooks trail in the bottom will almost inevitably become snagged, leading to tackle losses. Leads can also become snagged, and are best fixed to the rig using a weak link, also known as a rotten bottom. This is done by attaching the lead with a length of nylon weaker than the main reel line, so it will part instead under pressure. It's far better to lose just the lead than the entire rig. So with all of this to think about, why bother to drift fish if anchoring is so much easier? Actually, there are a number of reasons. Ground coverage putting your baits in front of more fish is one. Another is that some species such as pollock and cod respond better to a bait or lure on the move. But a lot of species don't. A case then of horses for courses. Fishing at anchor subdivides into two distinct categories. In very shallow water, uptide fishing, which involves casting baits away from the boat and anchoring them there with a wire grip lead, is a very good option when the fish are fearful of coming close to the boat due either to the shadow or the noise it puts out. This works particularly well down to depths of around 40 feet. 
where the water is deeper and there is no scur area around the boat, fish will often take baits drop straight down. When casting baits either up or across the tide, for my money, the best place to be standing is close to the wheelhouse. This should allow you to cast and keep your baits out of harm's way, particularly if others on board are having problems holding bottom. If their leads then fail to hold bottom, they will move away from yours, keeping you clear of tangles of their making. The fact that fish often swim down tide, and should therefore encounter your bait first, is another reason to be fishing from the front. But the reverse tends to be true when drop-down fishing. Then it's best to be as close to the back of the boat as possible. Again, there are good reasons for this. The two most important ones being potentially more fish and less tangles. At anchor, the person fishing the back of the boat should aim to have either his or her baits the furthest down tide. Fish picking up from the scent being washed from everybody's baits, then working their way back up tide to the source, should in theory at least come across the baits furthest down tide first. In addition to this, theoretically speaking at least, gear trotted the furthest away from the boat should also be clear of everybody else's and therefore free from tangles. When conditions do become demanding, particularly in terms of tide run, then it shouldn't be too difficult with a bit of cooperation for everyone on board to keep their gear from washing into other people's. Unfortunately, this doesn't always work. All right, Derek, it's all yours. All right, okay. One way of improving the prospects is for the person nearest the wheelhouse to use the heaviest lead, with each person going a little lighter towards the back to help keep the lines apart. Failing this, if tangles are causing problems, and in particular lost fishing time, it can pay to move as far up front as possible with plenty of lead, allowing you to avoid everybody else. There may well be fewer fish coming up at the front, but even so, this could still be an improvement on time losses caused by tangles. What often happens with party bookings, and particularly clubs, is that numbers relating to fishing positions are drawn out of a hat. Unless, of course, some people want to fish up tide at the front, while others drop down over the back. When individuals make up the party, it can become something of a free-for-all. Case, then, of first come, first served. So be sure and get there early, and be the first on the boat to stake your claim for your favourite spot. The final ingredient to improve your chances of success is preparation. The importance of quality bait, and having the right bait for the job, cannot be overstated. Because when it all comes down to it, the only thing of yours a fish should be interested in, is what you put onto the hook. The fresher that hookful is, and the more regularly it gets changed, the better your chances of catching fish. Expensive quality bait deserves to be protected from the sun. A cool box containing an ice pack covered by newspaper to prevent bait damage will greatly assist in the keeping of fresh bait. Frozen baits will also need to be looked after. It pays to take out only part of what you intend to use, so there's always something thawed something thawing, and the rest kept frozen inside. When fishing time is limited on a boat, the last thing you should be doing is wasting it on jobs that could and should have been done at home. A wallet filled with pre-tied traces, allowing you to switch rigs to target different species or simply replace losses makes very good sense. A spur outfit is also useful. A damaged eye or a problem reel can greatly hamper a day out. Having a second rod rigged up ready, especially when drifting where tackle losses are expected, can save time too, particularly when wreck fishing where shots at the fish come and go so quickly. When losses do occur, switch quickly to the second outfit, then re-rig the other when the boat is being taken back up tide for another drift. Finally, carry a good selection of terminal tackle, including a spur spool of line for the reel. Warm clothing, even in summer, is another must. You don't have to wear it if it gets too hot, but you won't have that choice if it's at home, when, as so often happens, the sun goes in and it starts to get cold. 
The trick, though, is not to bring along everything you own. Think things through and pack accordingly. Then get out there and enjoy the day.